Hi, and welcome back to this first day of Spring One 2020. Our next presentation is by Tiffany Jaccia. It's a leader's guide to DevOps practices and culture. Take it away, Tiffany. Hey everyone, welcome to uh, my session today at Spring One. So happy to be here. Uh, it's the leader's guide to DevOps practices and culture. And also pretty close to the end of Spring One, uh, the end of the first day of Spring One. So I hope everyone got the chance to learn a couple of things, hang out with people, maybe even meet some new people. Um, that's probably one of the uh, most exciting parts about being here uh, in this in industry events and and speaking in, uh, in spring, speaking at Spring One in general, uh, and and so hopefully this session is just another session to add to your main takeaways that you've had today. Uh, I know for a lot of people in digital transformation journeys or uh, DevOps journeys that the potential is really large, right? Not only to build. Uh, better products, amazing products that make people excited, uh, but also to work in amazing teams and even experience personal growth. And so that's uh, that's the main goal for this presentation is to share an understanding around DevOps and culture and even uh, sharing some DevOps practices that exist out there for targeting specific outcomes, successfully delivering software, you know, measuring that success and even uh, doing Doing well in an industry that's always changing. And so that's actually the components of this talk. We'll, we'll start by sharing some, um, uh, some understanding around DevOps. What are we in the business of when we talk about DevOps, right? And how do we get to a DevOps culture? What does even a DevOps culture mean? Uh, in in this in this case, and what are the practices and sort of concepts I can use in order to get a head start or even optimize uh, my DevOps journey? So hopefully this can help you and your teams and uh, in in your organization as well. So I always like to start with uh, a quote and and sort of a shared understanding around uh, who we are as a leader, who you are in within an organization, and one of my favorite quotes is actually from a leadership book uh, by Brene Brown. And she says, uh, really, for leaders uh, to, to do great leadership, it, it's that you want to be here to get things right um, and not so much about being right. Uh, and so it's, it's really about coming to our teams and understanding that we're there to serve them, right? We're there to help our people. We're there to work together to deliver something great together. Um, and it's not just all on one person to have all of the answers. It's not all on one person to manage uh, an entire project or entire and like all the pieces of a, a DevOps journey, but it's rather um, how we do it together in our delivery teams, right? Our cross-functional delivery teams. How do we do it across our development and security and operations teams as well? And so that's sort of the heart of this presentation. And I hope that uh, a lot of these practices and uh, tips apply to that very well. And so it's a great segue into talking about um, sort of the components of a DevOps journey and, and what it means to try to continuously deliver value when we talk about DevOps, right? And so um, we may know uh, each of these pieces, um, but they, they really do belong to certain groups of people traditionally, right? Your development teams are interested in developing features and new products and new uh, experiences for users. And so they typically own uh, Develop, co feature development, like coding and building and testing new features for customers. And your operations teams, they're, uh, they're about enabling and operationalizing our applications. So giving it to the hand, delivering it to the actual hands of our customers, right? And seeing like, uh, how does that impact um, the next iteration of work that we plan to do? And so it's a, in DevOps, it's really a cycle that we have that contains all of these pieces related to delivering software. And when we talk about DevOps, we really just want to enable the flow of each of these components so that they feed into each other. And it's this living, breathing process that we have uh, that delights users and delivers value um, as an organization. And so uh, when we talk about 
being a part of a DevOps organization or being a part of a DevOps journey, it's really enabling these processes. Uh, and I really like this diagram and you'll see it pretty often. Um, it's called the DevOps lifecycle and it includes all of these pieces together. Um, it, it nicely captures sort of all of the responsibilities and, and kind of outputs that we tend to have at the end of each process, right? Um, when a development team goes to code something, you know, we, we end up with a certain artifact or a certain application that we uh, that we can deploy, right? And after we deploy it, we uh, and it meets the customer's needs, right? Uh, we tend to have additional requirements, and those requirements are outputs uh, to planning sessions that we do, uh, which feed into again like our development teams. So it's it's this living, breathing thing, and each of these components all have specific outputs, uh, and in a DevOps. Uh, mentality, you want to really track how those outputs um, meet, uh, are related to your success, uh, or rather the outcomes that you want to achieve. And so uh, another concept, a major concept in DevOps is really, um, uh, you know, the three pillars that consist of, uh, that, that make up our DevOps journey, right? And that's our people, our process, and our technology. So you'll often hear that, you know, our, our people, it's, it's, it's basically a three-way street, right? Our people drive our processes and our processes drive our technologies. Our technologies, um, you know, are picked by people. They also, um, they all, uh, you know, they also tend to influence how we work with certain processes. So it's really this three-way street about uh, the intersection around uh, people, process, and technology. And so that's just something to keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about anything related to DevOps, uh, especially with these practices, right? Because they involve all three of these things. And sometimes it can be pretty daunting, right? When we have new people or people need additional skills or we need to develop new processes for our new technologies, or maybe when we're not no longer using a, a, a uh, a, a technology and we want to move forward with a different one. We have to set new processes. We sometimes have to incorporate new people. And so it's always something to think about in a, uh, in a DevOps capacity, right? Is that these three components are always moving around and uh, uh, ever evolving. Um, and so when we talk about a DevOps culture, we really want to incorporate these three things. And uh, culture can tend to be sort of intangible, hard to measure, or hard to understand. And I think it's because it's so complex that people can't really break down the pieces to articulate change. And so um, I like to think of it as a sort of onion and there are different layers to it, right? Um, and so within culture, there's how people, uh, the, the different mindsets that people have. It's the values, the principles. And then when you break it down even further, you get to specific practices, right? Uh, that are influenced by uh, the other layers and, and even tools, tool sets. And so uh, one of the biggest uh, tips around building a DevOps culture is that, you know, as an individual person or as a leader, you can only really have, you only have such a limited perspective on each of these aspects, right? Uh, sometimes being a leader means that you can only look at things from a top-down perspective. And so in order to build it bottom up, you really do have to start in certain areas, right? Maybe you start with the people that you really trust, like your specific team leads to kind of build a uh, practices and tools and each of these components of a culture uh, so that it's not only top down, influenced top down, but it's also influenced bottom up. Uh, and so uh, it's not that anyone has to uh, own uh, all of uh, all of the components of culture, but like if you can, uh, if you can only, if you want to assign specific people to specific layers, like maybe you trust your team leads to set certain principles and therefore practices and tools that uh, work well with them, that can be really helpful and um, really somewhere uh, so, uh, can get you uh, started in some places. Uh, even if it's just a matter of thinking about how do I enable a specific mindsets? How do I make people feel safe, uh, safe and embrace their mistakes? That can be a great starting pl uh, place as a leader, um, really providing like a, a foundational layer for people to feel safe so that they can talk about um, 
they can talk about their values. They can talk about certain principles that they want to have across the team and an organization. It's really set by your team. All uh, Everything related to a DevOps culture is really set by your team, right? And uh, each of these layers of uh, culture all impact, uh, impact what that means to people. And so uh, on the right here, I have a couple of uh, bullet points just sharing like uh, things that you want, outcomes that you want to achieve uh, in terms of a DevOps culture, right? And they're really around uh, embracing mistakes and communicating, communicating and collaborating. Uh, so thinking about how can I introduce specific uh, practices or um, uh, tools that help enable this? So if I want to really reduce silos across my team and my organization, maybe I have certain platforms or communication channels that open that up. Uh, maybe if I want to encourage collaboration and communication, I encourage people to do something like peer programming. Um, this is something that uh, some of the other sessions in this track talked about. Uh, it's just, you know, how do I do the, how do I do my best when I'm pair programming with someone else? How, how do I do my best when I'm planning in my planning sessions? Um, even around embracing mistakes, right? That's a really big one. Uh, so how do I, you know, how do I enable that through my practices? Like uh, maybe I want to host a retrospective, right? So how do I call out specific things that, um, you know, didn't wor really work well um, as a as a leader. So that's something to think about uh, because, as you know, like sometimes it's not even uh, one person's fault uh, on a particular thing. And uh, so maybe thinking about how you want to call out when you know a process doesn't work or a technology just doesn't work for you. Um, these are all really important aspects that help enable a DevOps culture. Um, and so it's and so this is actually a really great segue into talking about the specific practices that exist uh, in the DevOps space. And so uh, I actually will link a lot of the step by step guides to these practices They're They tend to be sometimes a little involved, depending on the specific uh, specific practice. Um, and so. Uh, I, I, I've actually written up a couple of guides that you can use, um, but uh, you'll see a lot of these practices being incorporated in um, consulting uh, firms that do digital transformations. Different agile coaches will sometimes talk about these practices. Uh, they actually, there's actually a book called the DevOps Handbook, which shares some of these practices as well. And they, they actually share how they can you can incorporate incorporate them into your DevOps uh, journey. And that's uh, that's the goal for this section of the presentation. I really just want to share, um, it, bring to your attention the practices that exist and sort of the concepts and the high level tips that you want to have um, uh, going into these practices so that you can uh, use them to kind of accelerate your journey and, and think about uh, how you can do DevOps better? How can you improve? Because um, it really is about starting small and iteratively improving. Uh, so the first, so the first practice is actually called uh, value stream mapping, and it's it's something that it's a practice and an exercise that you can do for pretty much any product or service that you have in, within your organization. And you essentially do it so that you can see where all of the, you can actually figure out what all of your streams of value are within an organization. Uh, and so it really helps you kind of understand at differing levels of uh, perspective, how efficient you are being in a certain process uh, and where, specific teams lie within delivering value uh, for that process. And so I'll actually show what that looks like. Um, this is a little sample diagram of a value stream map. Um, and so here I'm doing it for uh, a sample application. I call it <laughs> application one, but it could be pretty much any type of service or application. And essentially there's three different levels at this. There's a information flow, a material flow, and a time flow. So at the top, uh, if you start at the right, you'll actually have like a customer who provides a specific requirements or specific uh, information to a supplier. And that supplier will actually take those, uh, take that input from a customer and build material, um, build some type of product, right? And it, eventually that product will go back into the hands of a user. And so this is actually a cycle that gets produced between information that get, flows into uh, your organization and material that flows out. Um, and at every process, 
um, every process takes time. So uh, you just want to capture the, the flow of time for that process. And value stream mapping is a lean manufacturing practice. So uh, it's it's really, uh, it's used in several other industries. Um, if uh, a lot of DevOps practices actually borrow from lean manufacturing. So, um, you know, car companies, manufacturing companies use these practices to essentially eliminate waste and kind of understand where uh, uh, value lies within their organization. And so this can actually be really helpful for uh, software teams because we do produce something and we do it iteratively, right? Uh, and so, you know, it, it can be really daunting when you're in a large organization and you don't really understand where you lie within that value chain. And so this is a great kind of high level view of all the processes that it takes to uh, ship an application and where specific teams lie in that uh, process. So I'm actually going to break down each of those components. So really in a value stream mapping exercise, you want to just bring the right people into the room, right? Your main stakeholders, maybe your team leads that own specific processes. Uh, if I am a, for example, a banking company and I own a, a banking application, right? Uh, maybe I have a development team, a QA team, a change management board. I have uh, customers. Maybe bringing one or two of those people into the room uh, within each of those component, uh, those areas or those teams uh, is the right move for you to be able to create a value stream mapping exercise, a uh, value stream map, uh, which you can later share with other people uh, in the organization or even new new developers or engineers that are joining your organization, right? And so in an information flow, you really just want to define who is your customer, right? And how how do they get information? What what pieces of information do they get uh, to you as the supplier? And from there, right? Uh, once you have that information as a supplier, how that triggers your process, your end to end process, right? From start to finish, and finish means uh, it's in the hands of the customer, right? What are what were the what were the big steps taken in that process? And so that's uh, sort of your material flow, right? And you really just want to capture what happens in that process uh, and what is produced, right? And, and who owns that process. And so typically people will attach metrics to each of those processes. And one of the biggest ones aside from time is actually uh, a metric called percentage, uh, uh, the percent of complete and accurate. So if uh, one of my processes is to develop X requirement or X feature. Uh, the percent complete and accurate might be the percentage of uh, code releases or end of sprint releases that are complete and accurate, right? So of the work that I decided to take on, what percentage of that was complete and, and accurate? And accurate can mean different things to you. It could mean um, the percentage that... Uh, didn't fail uh, a build, didn't fail a production deployment, that kind of thing. It, it's really up to you, but uh, typically people will capture uh, metrics around each of those processes. And it helps people kind of understand sort of a good uh, current state uh, of your processes. And that's all you really want to do, right? It's just capture current state so that uh, maybe three months down the line, you can see, well, we went from, you know, 50% uh, of our work being incomplete and inaccurate to 100 uh, to 80% or something, right? And that's 30% growth. That's amazing. Uh, so that's something that you can think about. Uh, and then lastly, uh, what you want to capture in a value stream mapping exercise is just uh, the flow of time. So a good indication of uh, the flow of time is actually something called lead time. And that's start to finish. Um, every action takes time, even if you're not actually doing something. Uh, so maybe work is being is uh, is is being uh, shipped, but then there's not another team to pick it up for another three days. And so being able to track uh, how much time it's taking for uh, one process to get to another process can indicate like, oh, okay, maybe we do need to automate a specific area or we need to uh, have a certain process or a new technology in this area. And so this can really help you uh, if you are maybe new to a new project or maybe you inherited an existing one. Maybe you're even just having trouble understanding what exactly, uh, uh, what exactly happens within your value stream. 
uh, or within your organization, this can be a good start. So this is an example of my banking application, right? I have a customer, gives me some type of information, and that information turns into work for an application team to work on a specific fe uh, feature development uh, uh, feature. And uh, maybe it takes two days for me to process all of that information and get to an application team. That could be fine, you know, for my industry. Maybe it just takes two days because there's a lot of number crunching to do. There's a lot of processing. There's prioritization work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, then you can see like, okay, it takes me one day to do that feature development. Maybe the features are very small. That makes sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense and we want to do you know, a shorter time. It takes two hours to go from develop uh, for that that feature developed feature to go to QA, um, and the QA team they have a sixty percent uh, complete and accurate, meaning sixty percent of the code that they get is complete and accurate, uh, and it takes them a day to do QA. So these are just uh, some examples and so on and so forth. Um, I did this for the. You know, say for example, you have an ops team, um, and they handle a deployment to production and to a live uh, live environment. This can be something that also takes um, time. So, it's it's just a good map uh, to show uh, different people on your team where exactly they lie in the process and what uh, what at a very high level uh, those processes are. And this can be a really good exercise. Um, I've seen it work really well for different organizations um, because you start to talk about these specific processes and that gets those specific people thinking about, oh, well, maybe uh, we need to start looking at X technology or X uh, uh, process. Don't worry about, uh, don't try to get into the weeds too much when you're doing a value stream mapping exercise, but just know that those are things that tend to come up when you do these exercises. And so um, I, I talked a little bit about uh, sort of capturing current state and understanding like what are the, what is the value being delivered, right? But how do we kind of understand uh, and, and measure that success uh, when we do go to improve it or when we do go to ship something out, right? Um, that's actually the uh, second practice that I want to share and it's around capturing key metrics. Um, so key uh, DevOps metrics and what, what those are. So um, when you're capturing DevOps metrics, one thing that you just want to be wary of is um, getting obsessed with outputs versus outcomes. So in outputs, people will typically look at uh, individual KPIs. So they'll say, oh, you need to write uh, 500 lines of code each day. Uh, and, you know, you better commit three times uh, three times a day or something like that. Uh, that can be really dangerous because that puts a lot of stress on individuals when in reality, when we deliver value, we actually deliver it as a team, right? Our delivery teams are cross-functional. And so we really, really, when we say like, oh, we want to deliver X amount of lines of code, uh, it's not because we actually want those lines of code. It's because we want to deliver faster. For example, we want to deliver more value quickly, right? And so that's thinking about the outcome versus the output. And so you just want to be wary of any metric that puts a lot of stress on individuals uh, and, and try to shift that over to kind of understanding more about uh, what, what your process is and what is like the deliver, what is the health of your delivery processes that are currently in place. Uh, and so that's kind of the heart of uh, what, another book uh, that talks about DevOps metrics um, kind of shares. And, and that book is called Accelerate. Um, it shares a lot of uh, metrics that you can use that capture outcomes versus outputs and, and really put the focus on your, your teams and your process uh, rather than individuals. So um, something that I want to talk about is uh, what does it mean to deliver software, right? What does it mean to do it uh, continuously? And uh, I really like this quote. Uh, it's from a book 
called Continuous Delivery by Jess Humble. And he says, continuous delivery is the ability to get changes of all kinds, right, and all features into the production into production or into the hands of users. And you do it in three ways, safely, quickly, and sustainably. Uh, and so it really kind of maps into kind of four different areas of understanding, right? Uh, it's understanding our users, right? Are they happy with our product? Do they love our product? Um, you know, these are things that matter to us already. That's why we have customer success orgs. That's why we have UX and UI uh, designers, people who care about uh, the user experience, right? Uh, and and it's also thinking about the agility, like how fast we're doing things uh, uh, and, and delivering, and also the readiness of that delivery. Um, and not only the readiness, but also the stability uh, and, and pace at which we deliver. When we talk about uh, these three component, uh, all of these components, we're really talking about continuous delivery, and uh, and really enabling that process. And so, when we think about metrics, we really want them to just enable our decisions. And maybe if we don't really understand our users, or maybe we um, aren't aren't satisfying them, right? What does that mean for our uh, what does that mean in terms of decision making? What does that mean in terms of work that we're we need to plan and do? Uh, similarly, if you know we're not, uh, if we don't have the right tempo for not our frequency of delivery, what do we need to do in order to make that better? Right, our metrics help guide that and help uh, improve that because in reality we can't improve what we can't me measure, and so that's the heart of capturing a lot of the DevOps metrics. Um, and so a good place to start, and again, like thinking about um, that DevOps lifecycle that I was talking about, right? How do we enable, or how do we kind of understand even uh, at a high level, um, our processes around planning, coding, and and delivering uh, said code? Uh, and uh, Sweet. <laughs> um, we're almost at the last bit, um, but these are great metrics to start. And um, uh, I actually have a blog post that shares a lot of these concepts, but um, it's just a great, uh, it, this gives you a good uh, foundation. And lastly, last, uh, last practice is around understanding uh, the big picture for specific technologies. So how do you, how do you, how do you know if a right uh, if the tool set is right for you and how do you support your DevOps processes, right? Um, in terms of, you know, building up new skills, getting new people, um, introducing a new concept, right? Um, one of the practices is called uh, creating a big picture diagram. And a, in a big picture diagram, you essentially map all of your platform, uh, you map all of your existing platforms, technologies, and frameworks into specific environments. Uh, and so if you're an application, uh, so if you're an application developer, um, say, for example, you're working a, on a Java application, you know, you may have a JVM installed, uh, a command line, an IDE, all living in that environment. And then maybe you even have a development environment. So a Kubernetes cluster or something, just being able to understand the existing technologies within your ecosystem can help you make decisions and see if a technology uh, is a good fit. And so there's actually an example of what that looks like here. It can be kind of complicated if you have a lot of processes and technologies, but here, you know, at the top, you have an OpenShift cluster platform um, and, uh, specific environments that live under that OpenShift cluster. So you have default environments, you have a development environment, you have a test environment, production environment on the right, uh, and then on the left, you have your local environment. So these are things that you can map uh, into specific environments and better understand. Um, and so the, those are all the practices. I do wanna give people uh, some takeaways because we did share a lot of concepts and uh, uh, practices around uh, DevOps culture. So uh, again, DevOps practices is around people, process and technologies. And uh, really you just want to be able to incorporate those things so that you can track um, uh, uh, track and uh, improve them iteratively. And we do that through really focusing on the outcomes versus the outputs. So I hope that the session was really informative and helpful for doing just that. Um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to um, uh, chat right after the session, but uh, thank you for joining. 
Thanks, Tiffany. I always love to hear a shout out for Accelerate. This is the book that you should get if you're going to take that DevOps journey. Next, we're up with uh, Adib Saikali with a model of technical leadership. Doing a fast turn, so take that sip of drink and we'll be back in a minute.